Okay, thank you. It is always such an honor to be here. Thank you, Wyatt and Khaki and all the staff. Uh, no greater community, so thank you. I am reading from um, a novel that will come out in the spring. It's called Life After Life. And I thought I would just begin at the beginning. Um, hopefully it will make sense. There are a lot of characters involved, so then I'll stop and fill you in. But um, just so you know, if you were looking on the page, the type changes in two different places where the voice shifts once to a first-person notebook entry and then um, to a different voice, so I'll pause so that's clear. Joanna. Now Joanna is holding the hand of someone waiting for her daughter to arrive. Only months ago, this woman, Lois Flowers, was one of the regulars in Pine Haven's dining room, where the residents often linger long after the meal for some form of entertainment or another. She was a woman who kept her hair dyed black and never left her room without her hair and makeup and outfit just right. She had her color chart done in 1981 and kept the little swatches like paint chips in the zippered section of her purse. She told Joanna that having your colors done was one of the best investments a woman could ever make. <laughs> I'm a winner, she said, which is why turquoise looks so good on me. She loved to sing, and some nights she could convince several people to join in. Other nights she simply stood in one corner and swayed back and forth like she might have been in Las Vegas, singing everything she knew of Doris Day and Rosemary Clooney and Judy Garland. She loved everything Irvin Berlin had ever written. Now she has forgotten everything except the face of her daughter, random lyrics, and that your shoes and purse should always match. Joanna has watched the daughter night after night leaning into her mother's ear to sing. First up beat, clang, clang, clang went the trolley, and then ending with one of her favorites, like it could happen to you over the rainbow, what'll I do? Joanna, as ordered by Luke's many rules, keeps a notebook with an entry on each of the people she sits with. She has to do an official one to turn over to the nurse who oversees her work, but this is a different, personal notebook she writes just after someone has died. It's a notebook she bought and showed Luke to prove to him that she was taking his assignment seriously. A bright yellow college-ruled spiral-bound notebook which was all she could find at the thrifty market there close to his house. It was near the end for him, so she didn't venture far. This is my page, he told her. Everybody should get at least a page. She writes what she knows, their names and birthplaces and favorite things. Sometimes she asks questions. What is your first memory, your favorite time of day or holiday or teacher or article of clothing? How would you describe your marriage? Was there something you learned in your life that surprised you? She records the weather and season and last words if there are any. Luke said that this would be her religion, the last words and memories of the dying, her litany. She should read and reread the entries regularly like devotionals. Keep us alive, he said. Don't ever let us disappear. The longest and most expensive journey you will ever make is the one to yourself. Joanna's life is blip, blip, blip like images on an old film projector that keeps sticking and burning. She's been spliced a lot of times over the years, but finally she feels free. Not perfect, not problem free, just free. No one likes to talk about the positive parts of getting older and aging into orphanhood. How with your parents, you often bury a lot of things you were never able to confront or fix or let go of. She spent long hours discussing this with CJ, a girl most likely not to be Joanna's best friend, and yet she is. CJ is half her age, punk and pierced and tattooed with a baby boy whose father she won't discuss, not yet at least. 
CJ is beautiful and so unaware of it. Long legs and hazel eyes and a beautiful dark complexion that leaves people perplexed and wondering about her ethnicity. It seems she might even be perplexed herself and camouflages with tattoos and loose clothing and colors of hair dyes that are not natural to any race. Like Joanna, CJ has done a lot of different things. She's cleaned houses and red palms and groomed dogs, and now she grooms the elderly, hair, hands, toes, over at Pine Haven. She claims to have a lot of secrets, lots of ghosts, and she says she writes down all the bad stuff in her journal, which she calls Pandora's Box, and hides it there in the best security safe of all. She said she made a special trip to Costco to buy her safe deposit box, a mega-sized box of Kotex, which she then positioned at the back of her linen closet with the sentry placed in front, monostat and vagicil and all kinds of douches. She said it was a security system easily tested in the checkout line, the man next to her going from way too warm to icy cold in minutes. She said if there were ever any doubt, a good scratch in the right place would really get rid of someone you weren't interested in. <laughs> if something ever happens to me, she once told Joanna, everything you need to know is in the journal in the giant Kotex box at the back of the linen closet, and you can have everything I own, even Kurt, especially Kurt. Joanna told her that if anything ever happened to her, she had a fake book, Darwin's Descent of Man, that opens and holds important papers. She also has a fake can of Campbell's tomato soup. The bottom screws off, and someday, if she makes lots of money, that's where she plans to keep some for security. <laughs> you can have that and the doghouse, Joanna told her. Joanna wasn't there for her own mother, but she was there for her dad, and seeing him through those last days allowed her to let go herself. And of course, none of that would have happened without Luke and Tammy. In her work, Joanna has learned the importance of making peace. She sees it all the time, the stubborn child who won't come to the bedside, and so the parent lasts far longer than should be asked of anyone. It's painful to watch, and for this reason, she feels lucky to have journeyed her way back to this place. Her dad wanted her to promise to keep the doghouse running, and now she's doing her best, opening and closing and hiring responsible people to work the place so she can devote herself to the volunteer hospice hours she gives over in Pine Haven's nursing wing. Make their exits as gentle and loving as possible, Luke had said. Tell them how good it will be, even if you don't believe it yourself. You're Southern. You know how to do that. And now family members greet and embrace her like she's one of them. The relatives show her all the old photos and letters. They tell her of accomplishments and regrets. And then afterward, they drift away, her presence like something from an old dream, a reminder of their grief and loss. Sometimes they see her in the grocery or hardware store when they drive up to the doghouse and they can't help themselves. Their eyes well up, words get choked. Like Pavlov's dogs, they react to her. It makes her think of poor Harley, the docile old orange cat at Pine Haven, with enough poundage to warm even the coldest circulation-free feet. Only now all of the residents are terrified of him because of the story in a recent news broadcast about a cat who chose to curl up beside whoever was most likely to die. <laughs> The report speculated how the cat knew. Did he sense something? Did he smell some chemical release of a body shutting down? His track record was convincing enough that the people who worked in that particular place paid attention to where he spent his time, and the story told was convincing enough to ruin poor Harley's life there at Pine Haven. Once he was the most beloved and coveted creature in the place, and now he's greeted by shrieks and screams, slippers and plastic cups tossed his way. He's just a reminder of what is coming, a feline representation of Joanna herself, the one who appears bedside at the end and massages their cold, darkening feet. 
Now Lois Flower's daughter, Catherine, comes rushing into the room, a look of relief to find her mother still there. She's wearing her name tag from Bank of America where she's a teller. She knows there isn't much time. Lois has not opened her eyes in 18 hours, but her breathing does change when Catherine's cheek is pressed against hers. Catherine strokes the hair back from her mother's face and leans in close. She tells her how much she loves her, what a good mother she's been. She tells her about a new pair of shoes she just bought and how she got them for half price and what a beautiful June day it is. Clang, 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 she sings and then stops, shaking her head in disbelief that she's here in this moment. How can it be, her expression seems to ask. It's an ordinary Friday morning, and Joanna cannot help but imagine what it would have been like if she had had the chance to be with her own mother, to lean in close and whisper goodbye, and in that moment there's a change in the air, and in that moment they all come back to her, all of those last days, last words, last breaths. Catherine whispers the words, what'll I do? And then it's time. Without a word, everything changes, and they know that it's time. Notes about Lois Elizabeth Malcolm Flowers, born July 14, 1929, died Friday, June 7, 2010, at approximately 10.35 a.m., Pine Haven Retirement Facility, Fulton, North Carolina. It was a warm, sunny day, drapes fully open to let all the light in, just as Lois Flowers always requested. The room was comfortable. Somehow, in spite of all the stark nursing apparatus, the room was as welcoming as Lois herself. On the very first day, she invited me in and told me how lovely it was to have me there. Not the ideal situation, she said, but still lovely to see you. She said she had not known my parents well, but sure did like those hot dogs my dad made, especially the Chihuahua, because who ever heard of putting hot salsa on a plain old hot dog? Lois Flowers loved music and she loved fashion. She had a subscription to Vogue that had never lapsed in over 40 years. You could never get away with outfits like that here in Fulton, she said, but it's important to know what folks are wearing elsewhere. She loved turquoise and the way people complimented her when she wore it. I'm a winner, she liked to say, and referred often to a folder labeled Personal Color Harmony and all the little samples within. She never went shopping for clothes or lipstick without it. Her favorite holiday was Halloween because she loved to see children having so much fun, but mainly because she liked a good excuse to wear orange even though her chart said that winners do not wear orange well. <laughs> she decided that even if she looked hard, so what? It was Halloween. But, she said, I looked quite striking in an orange alpaca sweater and black gabardine slacks. It's the one time the chart got it wrong. She still had the orange sweater and insisted that I take it and promise to wear it every October 31st. She gave her daughter Catherine the newer Halloween sweater, a honey-colored cashmere with black cap buttons. Catherine is a true autumn and that sweater is perfect for her, she said. You can see why I want everything perfect for her. She suggested I rethink the way I wear my hair and then put a hand to her mouth and apologize for such a rude remark. This is all new to me, she told me. This way I say things I don't mean to say. And I was able to assure her that I completely understood and that I am reconsidering what to do with my hair. She smiled and blew me a kiss. She said, how about some golden highlights and something layered to give body? She had matchbooks from every nice restaurant she had ever gone to. Her favorites were Tavern on the Green and Windows on the World. She said she loved eating in New York City. She said her husband teased her that all it took for her to love a restaurant was for it to be in New York and have lots of windows and a preposition in the name. <laughs> she told Catherine she needed to get back there, that they should take a trip, see a show. When told that both restaurants were gone, she held a firm position that she still intended to go. And you need to go too, she said, always pulling me into the conversation. And if there's not a young man in your life, she asked me often if I had met anyone interesting. She said I should just go alone. 
Women do that now, she said. A woman can go wherever she wants, right by herself. Once, while her husband and Catherine were out at the county fair, Lois Flowers burned her maiden form bra in a hibachi in their backyard. <laughs> when her husband asked, what's that smell? She said she had no earthly idea. <laughs> she said it made her feel connected to something big and important, that she stood there in the backyard and pretended she was at a rally in a city. She never told him what she had done, even when she saw him studying the ashes in what looked like a scrap of nylon. She had never even told anyone about it until that day. She said, I have always felt liberated. <laughs> Lois Flowers. The best table is over by the window, a big glass window, and you can see the whole city just like a bird soaring in the sky white linen and candles, and yes, just a little champagne, knives and forks and ice and crystal, and a crystal ashtray, too, the filter smudged with her latest color, claret, a perfect color, one of her reds, all of the colors on the chart. Every chip may be taken a little darker or a little lighter. You can match clothing, makeup, accessories, and interior decor to colors on your chart. Don't ever remove the tags until you check your purchase in natural daylight as well as artificial light. Daylight, she can feel the daylight, and even this high up and behind all this glass, she can hear the birds. There's lovely music, too, and a bathroom attendant. They shake hands. They brush cheeks. What'll I do? Oh, thank you ever so much. Thank you for your assistance. A plaid should always have at least two of your colors. The second eye color catches the glint, streaks, and flecks in your eyes. Her daughter has green flecks, like her father. She's in autumn, beautiful rusts and greens and golds and new shoes, homework. Do you have homework, honey? Daylight and Chanel number no. five, cheek to cheek and lovely. And there's music and there are lots of little goodies over there on a big silver tray over by the big window. All shapes and sizes of beautiful and delicious canapes and the light fixtures are exquisite. And there's more music, always music and colors, lots of colors. Just the right colors for a busy woman on the go. High heels click, click, click on that polished marble floor. And if she stands perfectly still, she can feel the building sway. The whole city below her is so bright and beautiful it leaves her lightheaded. And she feels the building sway back and forth like a song, like a slow and easy swaying song. Um, so then a couple other characters come in. Uh, from other places in the book, all moving towards one another. Uh, so I'm going to jump back, though, to the next Joanna section for the sake of ease um, and the pattern with um, the notes of various people she sits with continue to come uh, are spliced through the various voices. Joanna, do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe in the power of magic? Do you believe that a normal, ordinary girl can disappear right before your eyes? <laughs> Joanna had run the words through her mind many times over the years, picturing her childhood friend Ben waving his wand and directing her in and out of boxes, first in his garage and then on the school auditorium stage, pulling from his sleeves coins and lengths of scarves and puny bouquets picked from neighborhood yards when the neighbors weren't looking. He said they were partners for life bound by their secrets and knowledge. It was a vow, a pact, a solemn oath of loyalty. Now that she's back home 30 years and a million miles and a lot of mistakes and lessons behind her, she's aware of it all as never before. The ghost, the magic, all the ways a person might disappear. The longest and most expensive journey you will ever make is the one to yourself. This is Joanna's current mantra, in her head since the day four years ago when Luke stepped in and changed her life. He said it first. He said he would love nothing better than to purchase the ticket that would upgrade and jumpstart her trip. He said so many things during the brief time they were together, things that are now dog-eared in her mind so that she thinks of them, repeats them, relies on them every day. Without him, she could never have found her way back to this place, back to her father's side in time to make amends, 
back to the flat, swampy land that has been home even in the years she spent elsewhere. All those years and miles away, and still she often fell asleep conjuring images of the Saxon River, that cold, dark water winding its way through the green swamp and on down to the Carolina coast, the wide sandy shore, and the white-hot light of summer. She loved the glaze of salt that covered the windows like ice in another lifetime, and she had had so many, like a cat, and like a cat she had returned home. It was an investment, her dad had told her, about the doghouse, a drive through hot dog franchise he had bought two years before he died. If I'd known you would ever grace us, well now just me, with a return home, maybe I would have gone in for hair or nails or tans. But I like a good hot dog and your mother liked a good hot dog and they aren't easy to come by. He said this before they knew he was dying and so there was still plenty of time and room for the sarcasm and innuendo that had long forced them apart. And the hot dogs are good, no doubt about it. And the place is very popular with the kids from town looking for some place to go on their way to the beach. People love the way they can drive up and order something off the menu like, I'll have a puppy, two old yellers, and a chihuahua. <laughs> Never been much on hair and tans, she told him. Her skin so white from years spent in Chicago and then Maine and New Hampshire. Her unruly hair, a shaggy cropped cut she often did herself coloring in the gray of her temples with a sharpie. True, he had said. He had shown her where everything was within the tiny structure. The young man had hired to manage the place was off in the corner chopping onions and filling the sauerkraut bin for the German shepherd, trying to pretend he wasn't listening. It would have made your mother so happy if you had ever taken her advice about anything, men, school, clothes, your hair. But no, that was just too hard, wasn't it? I guess I've always been in the doghouse, she said. Her dad finally laughed and said her mother had said the same thing. And the thought of her mother and the fact that they had never made up hung in the air around them. Your mother said you chose to be in the doghouse, her dad had said. But he did not add the sentence that had so often come out of one of her parents' mouths. You made your bed, now lie in it or when she ran from what appeared to them a perfectly good life with a man she was lucky to marry, lie down with dogs, get up with fleas. Yes, you chose the doghouse, he said, the air reeking of onions. His old white apron, one her mother had once worn, was splotched with condiments, and she noticed how tired he looked and how his hands were smaller than she had remembered. You did it all by yourself. When she was 20, she would have argued with him. She would have yelled that they were rigid, ignorant people who only cared about what everybody else thought, the neighbors, the relatives, the people at church. Who gave a damn? Why couldn't they just care about her? Why, when she got 99 out of 100 correct, were they so quick to study and scrutinize the one little failure? So much attention given to what was wrong instead of what was right. And when she was 30, she still would have gotten angry, but would have just slammed the door or the phone receiver and taken it out on whatever poor soul was with her at the time. Whatever they were doing in that moment, eating a holiday dinner, making love, planting trees, ruined and lost to that cavernous black hole. She would have had an extra drink or two and blamed her parents for the excess. But in her mid-40s after life with Luke, she was finally able to see her father for what he was, a worn-out man who had worked very hard and lived the only way he knew how, rigid and unforgiving from his own upbringing, too scared to have ever ventured beyond that knowledge, frightened by the thought of death, ashamed of his weak nakedness, and in need of love with no sense of how to ask for it. Those are the ones who will need you the most, Luke had pointed out, and sure enough, Early in her training as a hospice volunteer, this became all too evident. Now it's a scene she sees often as she sits bedside by those who have reached their final destination. It's a very simple equation that comes at the end, a focus on what they have and what they don't have, a glass half full or empty, a weighing of one against the other. Sometimes the focus is just the magnification of what has always been there, but always, they're waiting for something, a face, a word, an apology, permission, a touch, 
Bix flicking with a frenzied vengeance at the great rock concert of life for just one more. One more song, word, sip of water. Some have many hands reaching from the bedside and others have none. And yet in that final moment, the air heavy and laden as molecules regroup and reshape in preparation, it's all the same. It's like the moment when a snake enters the yard and the birds fall silent. The silence begs your attention. It's time to go. The journey's over. It's okay, she told her dad and ran an ice chip around his lips, his mouth turning toward her. All my experience in the doghouse will help me run the family business. Family business, he mumbled and laughed. He was too weak to say much. It was the end and she whispered to him what she had learned to whisper with great confidence. It's okay to let go. Only with him she had the desire to keep him just a little bit longer. She had never given up the idea that he might say he loved her. Each time she had said the words, he only smiled. And this time he said, you're my little girl. They were in the house where she had grown up, a small brick ranch on a corner lot, flat yard full of spindly pine trees and bee field azaleas. The hospital bed filled what had once been her bedroom, his choice. He wanted to die where his wife had died, and she in her illness had chosen Joanna's room in order to keep theirs intact so that he could go to bed in a normal way as she lay dying at the other end of the house. Joanna allowed herself to imagine that her mother had wanted to see her, that if she had been able, she would have said something, sent a message. Luke told her she had to let it go, let it go, along with her realization that the night her mother died coincided with her own one night stand with someone whose name she could not even remember, a journalist from somewhere in the Midwest who had a passion for Russian literature and talked about his ex-wife all night. Just another lonely heart who stayed at a boring party too long. Why don't I just go throw myself in front of a train, she said, when she woke up in his strange hotel bed to hear him leaving sloppy messages on his wife's answering machine. She stared out the high narrow windows of what had once been her bedroom. As a child, she had needed to stand on her bed or a chair to see out. Cars were passing the way they would on any normal Tuesday morning, and the azaleas were blooming as they did every spring. A row of daffodils lining the concrete walk came up just as they had since she planted them at age five, her mother addressing the bulbs by their formal name, King Alfred, as she oversaw Joanna's work, the depth of the hole, the teaspoon of bone meal, the years had left them spindly and bloomless, but there they were. In spite of everything, there they were. And that was when he died. She was thinking of those daffodils. King Alfred withered to a pauper, and the air in the room changed as it always does. Sparked, clear, sudden, and he was gone. The longest and most expensive journey is the one to yourself. Luke liked to add that some people never even purchase a ticket. Some only get halfway. Some stand like Moses glimpsing the promised land, which he maintained was, for all practical purposes, about as good as getting there. Clear vision, he said, and then added, like Visine or Vaseline or Clearasil, so pumped with morphine by the end that his language was like some haystack of non sequiturs filled with golden needles, fragile bits of truth and wisdom she needed to collect. For a long time, her mantra had been, fuck you from the bottom of my fucked up heart. So clearly, she had come some distance. <laughs> California, New York, Chicago, New England, she did it all. But what she learned is that sooner or later, you have to stop running. And when you do, the baggage comes slamming into you at freight train speed. She stopped running in New Hampshire four years ago when she fell asleep assuming she'd be dead within the hour and then woke to the warm hand of a stranger in the distant wail of a siren. Only then was she able to slowly pull it together. Only then did she buy the ticket. Now when Joanna thinks about dying, she thinks of the day she almost did, the careful planning, the way the light looked there in the late afternoon sky, it was only four, but already nearing dark. 
It was her favorite kind of day, and she had come to New Hampshire seeking it, seeking some resolution to what felt like a really lousy story. There was wood smoke in the air, birds rustling in the leaves, her breath visible as she stared at the distant outline of the white mountains. There was a Chinese dogwood, bright red stems against the backdrop of snow, and it occurred to her that if she were staying, she would cut some and put them in a vase. The hot tub on the deck was almost as big as the rented cottage and set in ground like a pool. The rental guy, a middle-aged, soft-bodied man who smelled like Febreze and chicken soup, told her the heater was busted and he hoped she wasn't disappointed. It's got those powerful jets and holds up to ten men, he said, clearly well-versed in hot tubs and their potential. And she told him a big vat of poached men was the last thing she cared to think about at the moment. In fact, it left her feeling nauseated. If he had meant to be flirting, and he may have been, she had always had such a hard time telling, that cooled it. He handed her the key and a free DVD rental, and she drove straight to the liquor store and then down the long wooded drive to the small, somewhat run-down cottage. Nothing worked right. Burned out porch light, two of the gas burners not working, the bed soft as pudding and stale. But what did it matter? She poured a glass of vodka and went outside. The giant ten-man hot tub with jet should have been covered, a light snow already falling, but it wasn't her job. She was just a weekend renter, someone on a shitty vacation, a dog looking for a place to die. She took pills so it would all be an accident, just the right amount for a distracted insomniac to accidentally take. She had even practiced a couple of times. This is the right amount, sloppy notes told her, scrawled as she passed out. Fuck you from the bottom of your fucked up heart. She closed her eyes and imagined the ocean, the rhythmic sound of her childhood, the rocking motion of waves against sand like the lava lamp Ben had in his dorm room all those years ago, back and forth, back and forth, steady as a pendulum been expecting her visit and it was awkward in a way she would never have thought possible. They were partners after all, best friends bound by the secret oaths, she reminded him. And so he canceled his plans, clearly a date, and they ended up having a night together that pretty much finished the friendship if in fact anything had been left. He treated her no differently than he would of the girl who got stood up or probably any other average ordinary girl. Now you see her, now you don't. She imagined a plug pulled from the ocean, sucking and swirling and spiraling downward until all that was left visible there on the sandy floor was shell and rock and glass and bone. She felt the ice water and how heavy her boots were, full and heavy. She was thinking how people have drowned in little bowls of water, and she was thinking of her childhood, the magic shows, the way Ben had her tie his hands and then his legs together before he jumped from the small bridge over the river where they used to all gather to swim. Then he would break the surface, grinning and twirling the ropes over his head. He had been Houdini, and she was his loyal assistant. Ladies and gentlemen, now I will make this normal, ordinary girl disappear. To disappear was her wish that night in New Hampshire. The night with Ben had meant nothing to him. It vanished into thin air, and yet it haunted and weighed her down. And the haunting continued even as he ran ahead and never looked back. So she got married. It was just that easy to set off in the wrong direction. It was like finding a seat on the train, leg room, and a place for your baggage, the comfort of knowing a stranger wouldn't plop down beside you. Done, fini, one door slammed, and the china and flowers are all a great distraction, the best sleight of hand. Escape by matrimony, Luke had said, a very common vehicle in our society. But the same can be accomplished with a job or a religion or a hobby, he added, and those things are easier to leave and change. She was such a liar and a bad friend, not to mention a horrible wife, and when it felt too wrong to think about anymore, she left. She had never fit in California where he was a grad student, and she had never been good at breaking up with people either. She couldn't even change her hairstylist or mechanic for fear of hurting their feelings, so she just took off. 
the kind of abandonment that makes those left behind relieved to be done with her. She got a divorce by proxy and told him to keep all the things since it was such bad luck he had married her in the first place. Enjoy the fondue pot and walk, hot the silver. Once the pattern was established, it was easy to continue. Temp jobs, temp relationships, whatever blew her way and on and on. And then she got the call that her mother died and everything really spiraled out of control. The water was cold and her clothes heavy, boots filling. There was a crack along the bottom of the hot tub like a broken highway to nowhere. Ben's best trick had always been to make her disappear and that's what she had done. He even tried to get in touch with her a few times saying he wanted her to meet his wife. He had a baby daughter. He was sorry her mother died. But she had already long disappeared. She was old news, bits of gossip her parents and then her dad had attempted to sweep from the stoop. She was reaching her hand out to trace that crack, no ropes, no cuffs, letting the key to the cottage drop from her hand when something grabbed her hard. There was a sharp pain in her shoulder, deep and throbbing, and her mouth filled with water, and that was all she remembered. Later, she would get a tattoo to remind her, a big purple blob of a tattoo, horseshoe-shaped, to replicate the bite of a huge dog. She later kept thinking of that old hymn, Love Lifted Me, love in the monstrous form of Tammy, 150 pounds of fur and jowls and drool. She would later learn that Tammy didn't like for anyone to be in the water, always assuming they needed to be saved. Luke had taken her in when the young family she belonged to couldn't break her of pulling their kids from the lake every time they tried to swim. <laughs> the kids, bruised and tormented, got agitated when they saw her coming, and she read their agitation as trouble and fear and got to work, her big webbed paws propelling her to their rescue. Those kids had named her Nana after the dog in Peter Pan, but Luke decided to rename her in case she had any problems connected to all the times her name had been shrieked in anger. They were in the emergency room, and he told Joanna he had named her after a song he loved as a kid, Tammy by Debbie Reynolds. He said he had wanted to be Debbie Reynolds. Tammy has a real missionary complex, Luke said. She wants to save everyone. He was bone thin with a shaved head and big dark eyes, either a manic runner or a cancer patient. She didn't mean to say that aloud, but she did, because he told her he was both. Not cancer per se, but he was dying, and he had been a runner since the late 70s. He stood by her gurney and extended an equally bony hand, no ring, no watch, Tammy and I have a lot of the same problems, he said. Fortunately, she's not dying and I don't shit in the front yard. <laughs> Joanna learned so much about him in the hours he sat there with her. He had grown up near Boston but spent his summers on Lake Winnipesaukee. He preferred the politics of Massachusetts and Vermont, but New Hampshire was backdrop for the best memories of his childhood, and he was convinced that if he claimed all the parts he really loved, he would be able to make peace with everything else. After it was all over, she thanked him for saving her, and he said that really Tammy saved her. All he did was let the giant dog out to pee. He said there were two kinds of creatures in the world. There are those in dresses fighting for the lifeboats, and there are those making sure that others are saved, like the man in the footage of that plane crash in the Potomac who passed the life rope so many times he didn't make it himself. I really like to think I'd be a rope passer, he said, and pulled Tammy in close and kissed her big head, and Tammy is definitely a rope passer. Luke believed in a lot of things Joanna had always thought were bullshit, and yet how could she doubt him there at the end when he reached his hand forward to those he said were waiting for him? They're here, he said, and pointed to the darkened hallway. He told her that there was a time when he believed nothing. The older he got, the less he believed, and then he found that the less he believed, the more capable he was of believing. 
After the rescue, Luke made her go to classes and to therapy. He said the price of a safe life was educating herself, healing herself, loving herself. It was impossible to get too angry once she knew the situation of his life. He really was dying, and she felt foolish to have tried. She tried to explain that it was all an accident. She didn't want to hurt anyone. She just wanted it all to be a quiet accident, just another mistake. All she had wanted was to slip from the earth with, with as little trace as possible. She wanted to disappear. Now the day that Tammy saved her seems light years away, many, many miles behind her, and yet she wakes to it and falls asleep to it, the touchstone. In the summer, when Joanna is wearing something sleeveless, some unknowing kind person will often rush forward to ask what happened, hands held a safe distance from the big purple dog bite. It's a tattoo, she says, and sometimes she adds without explanation that it's meant to simulate a great big dog bite. It's Tammy's teeth, something akin to rosebud or Zuzu's petals or whatever it is in life that reminds you you're alive. Um, and I think if I'm not keeping you too long, I'm going in with something that's going to take it upbeat just a tad to in prep for the for the cocktail party. And and I apologize to those of you who have heard it before. It's just a brief sampling of the voice of one of the women who lives um, in in this nursing home. Um, well, actually, she's in a cottage. She's she hasn't migrated that far yet, but. Um, She's a retired teacher who's on a bit of a rant, and I, I will just end with her. Her name is Toby. I was a good teacher for 40 years, and it only started getting hard when everything changed. One day I was a normal teacher in a normal classroom. The next thing I knew, the children were coming in with names like Bandana and Eurasia and Montpelier. And I said, those are things and places, children, and you are people. What on earth is going on? And there were names I couldn't even pronounce, and I can guarantee you that you don't readily go calling names you can't say. I'm looking for the Johns and Bills and Toms, and they just weren't there anymore. I'm a human, a woman. I was an English teacher and a bit of an amateur writer myself, but I'll tell you things went so far off course, I just didn't even know where I was anymore. What once was generous compassion for high school students with all their angst and crap going on turned into pure tea agitation and fury. I didn't get frustrated by who I am. I got frustrated by what they were reading and wanting to write about. I said, you're too smart for all this shit. Dwarfs and wizards and gnomes and vampires. <laughs> Big blue aliens with tails like monkeys. I said, what I wouldn't give for a good old-fashioned story about somebody losing his or her virginity or getting an abortion. Grandma died, and for the first time I knew I was mortal. Or what about the one where the boy doesn't want to kill a deer, but granddaddy makes him so he can be a man? I was wanting to write something myself, and it was dying to get out of my head, but couldn't find the door. It was also plugged up with that malarkey. I had worked so hard, and all I was longing for was some whining little boy who didn't want to kill a deer. I was craving one, in fact, would have loved him and given him an instant A. And where did all the orphans go? Jane and Oliver and Pip? It's an honorable and very dramatic position. And the girl who's upset to have a period? Where did she go? Or the one all torn up about losing her virginity? Where did she go? If they're still out there, they're keeping a low profile and hiding from all those getting boobs for Christmas and graduation and making themselves up to look 30. I wanted dead deers and dead grandparents and busted condoms. I wanted anything other than a zombie or a shape-shifting demon wolf coyote bullshit. What am I to do with a bunch of aliens at Armageddon? Some of them said about their papers, I meant to be vague, like that might excuse something that didn't make a goddamn bit of sense. Or the one who said, I just didn't get what he was doing because it's so brilliant. I took my work seriously, and where did it get me? 
There I was asking for a little reality, and who wouldn't be after Columbine? What teacher on the planet after Virginia Tech didn't study her classroom windows and doors and the desk arrangements and hatch some plan for how she would protect all those young bodies, even the ones that got on her last goddamn nerve? And then this one boy, meaning to push my button, this one boy named something like Montreal Fedora <laughs> offered up some literary criticism on the death of Julius Caesar. He said, and I quote, them dudes was mean as shit, weren't they? <laughs> and I said, those dudes were mean as shit. <laughs> that is what I got in trouble for. Some kid in there, probably Parker, Ramsey, or Tate, ran home and tattled, not about what was being discussed in class, but that the teacher said shit. Miss Tyler, come to the office, please. Miss Tyler, please come to the office. This had happened many times. I made a notch on my desk, in fact, every time it happened, and one whole side looked like a fine-tooth comb. <laughs> my principal was about 14 and had never read Shakespeare. <laughs> How do I know? I asked him one day. In that moment when I needed him on my side, I almost wished that I had not done that or that I had been a teacher who did not argue against prayer in my class, which I had done for years, or did not allow hats, but what in the hell did I care if they wore hats? Some of them might have been sporting bad haircuts they were ashamed of or keeping their lice locked in. What did I care? I didn't tell on kids who refused to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance either. I figured we'd have plenty of battles to fight and I needed to choose the most important. I mean, these are humans growing up and witnessing the uterus as a competitive sporting arena. Who would have ever thought that? Irresponsible birth control will get you a TV show and a magazine cover. Octo, sexto, moron. I said to my principal, the boy King, I asked him, if I retire like you say I have to, who will teach these children? Who will guard the gate? Who can promise me they'll tell the boys to keep their trousers zipped and tell the girls not to go promising things they do not intend to deliver? Who will teach birth control? Who will teach the value of literature? Who will teach manners? I said, who will tell them nobody gives a shit about how dwarves and trolls have sex? If they had, the Brothers Grimm would have figured it out and already done it. They had every opportunity opportunity. What I wouldn't have given for a stained soul, just one good stained soul. Thank you.